welcome, welcome, y'all. Hard work paying off. Let's go. Um, so welcome to the uh, 2023 Spring Showcase. Um, I'm just excited to celebrate all you guys' hard work today and like really get detailed information on what everybody's been doing. So next slide, we're just gonna, you know, talk about a little net etiquette. Web etiquette, I guess I should say. So if you're on Zoom, um, just please keep everything muted. Um, if you do have a burning question, go ahead and throw it in the chat and we'll address it at the end. And if you want to turn your cameras on so we can see your bright, shiny faces, that's always nice too. I am part of the leadership team. Uh, we are voted in at the beginning of each, at the beginning of each term. And we just kind of cover the uh, background logistics and uh, just give support to y'all or the solutioneers through the process, as well as like showing up for their events. Um, and then we are called the LT team, the leadership team. I'm Matt Kester. I am the VP of events. I'm a senior about to graduate in like a week and a half. Woo! <laughs> so uh, thank you. Um, applause to the end from, from here on out. But I appreciate that. Um, and uh, also I've been in green light for uh, uh, two, two terms now or two semesters. So yeah, I'm Lauren Taylor. I am a sophomore here at ASU studying sustainability, and this is my third semester in Greenlight. And I'm the VP of recruitment. Hi, everybody. My name is Grace Ryder. I'm also a sophomore studying sustainability, and I'm the vice president of operations. This is actually just my first semester here at Greenlight. Hi, my name is Kaylee Sines. I am a sustainability major, and this is my third semester with Greenlight. So next we're going to introduce our operations team if some of our interns want to step up here as well as our staff. And the operations team leads our day-to-day -day activity as well as six different programs. All righty guys, hi I'm Ashley, a sort of executive director of Care Green Light Solutions, started as a student in the program. And now I'll pass back to Gemini. Hi everyone, I'm Gemini. I am the program coordinator at Green Light Solutions. And uh, sorry, I'm stepping on the board there. Um, I'm the program coordinator at Greenlight Solutions. I started out as a solutioneer, was on the LT, and now here I am. Hi, okay. uh, my name's Brandon. Um, I'm a bookkeeper, do all their finances and accounting, and uh, make sure you guys got funds to do what you do. Uh, I'm Sean. I uh, put out fires when needed and help <laughs> set up IT stuff like this. <laughs> Hi, I'm Carissa. I'm a nonprofit development intern, and I'm getting my master's in sustainability solutions. Congratulations. Okay, I'm going to give Troy's intro. Uh, <laughs> Troy, good to have you here. So, uh, Troy is our nonprofit development intern as well. Uh, he just got his master's in executive sustainability leadership and um, another awesome asset to the team as well. So, uh, we work really hard to uh, make the sustainability projects happen, um, as, as each and every one of you do as well. So, um, we're excited to hand it off to the next. Uh, to Grace. Thanks, guys. All right, so next is our board of directors. We'll briefly introduce um, our board of directors leads our organization at large. And one fun fact about them is that three of our co-founders actually still serve on the board of directors today. They're the ones who founded it in their undergraduate uh, degree 10 years ago. So that's pretty exciting. So first, um, Max Ch Crispin is the chair's person, and then we have Keith Jones, who's our vice chair. Kina Federshock is our treasurer, and Kevin Kelleher was the co-founder and a current board member, um, as well as Nathan Gaxman, who is also co-founder and board member, and uh, also Ryan Morris, a co-founder. Then we have Christine Siofi, who is a board member, and Monsieur Huck, uh, who was also a project partner along with being a board member. And then we have Max Scott, uh, Siddharth Mazuda and Ashley Weissman, our executive director. I now introduce our fund committee. So fund stands for fundraising, uplifting, and networking. The fund committee works to spread our message and to engage with the greater community at large. You can join the fund community fund committee by volunteering for just five hours a month. Our current members include Alan, Madeline, Isabel, Isabella, Blake, Jessica, Beirut, Juliana, Lee, and Justin. Our project partners is the is a term that we coined for the organizations that we partner with to work on our student-led sustainability projects 
they come to us with a sustainability challenge that they're facing and we work with them to uh, help find a solution for it. Our current part, project partners is Master at Dynamic RD, Gemini at Greenlight, Jill at Green Education, and Tyler at Walter Sustainability Solutions Service. And our solution year mentors are mentors who volunteer their time to uh, help our solution years with project success as well as with career readiness. Our current solution year mentors is Ryan with Walter Sustainability Solution Services, Rajan with Dynamic RE, and Michael with Green Education. All right, so we keep talking about this term solutioneers, and for those of you that are not solutioneers in the room, I'll just kind of go through a brief description of what we're talking about. So our solutioneers are college students who serve on our student-led sustainability project teams, and they get to get experience in the field solving real-world sustainability problems and challenges. So to run through our teams really quickly, um, all of you guys will be coming up later and introducing yourselves, but first we have our Walton Sustainability Solutions Service. Next, we have our Green Event Services Team, our Green Education Team, and finally, our Dynamic Team. So before we get started today with all of you guys coming up and presenting your awesome projects, I wanted to talk a little bit about how this event is sustainability recognized and how other events on campus can be as well. So this is a project that um, university sustainability practices created um, that students are able to uh, recognize their event as sustainability certified. So there's a few different criteria that you have to hit. I'm just going to run through some of the ones that we've hit today. So um, our event planning team has a sustainability representative. As you can tell, all of us are really involved in sustain sustainability. So this was an easy one to check off the list. Um, our marketing materials were digitally distributed. So um, as opposed to paper or other wasteful materials like that, um, all of our decorations and supplies have been reused. And as you can also see, our recycling and landfill bins are right next to one another. So please be conscientious of how you dispose of your waste during this event. So now, please welcome in, in me in introducing Ashley Wiseman, our Executive Director to Greenlight. Um, Ashley began her journey with Greenlight Solutions in 2016, transitioning from a student solutioneer to an intern, to a pro program development director, to now the Executive Director as of 2020. So let's involve... Probably should have uh, changed the photo. Um, but thank you guys so much for coming today. Um, I know we usually have a, a bit of a bigger turnout, but you know what? I'm really excited and really proud for the, of each and every one of you. Um, we'll be able to use this video, um, you know, for your professional portfolios, um, you know, and they'll be posted on our YouTube. So it's not just about the exposure you're getting right now, but also the exposure that you will have after today's uh, event as well. And we also have about 20 people on Zoom watching as well. So um, first, I want to um, talk a little bit about the last 10 years. We are now um, celebrating 10 years of Greenlight Solutions, and it has been an incredible journey. Um, as Grace mentioned earlier, um, as Lauren mentioned earlier, um, our three co-founders actually serve on the board of directors to this day, and they were three um, ASU students that got together one day, and they said, hey, we're about to get these degrees, but we don't really have any type of experience to show for it, right? Like we've been learning about this thing in the classroom, but we haven't had the ability to get some experience. So they said, okay, let's change that. They went and did a project with the WWF and they found this project to be so valuable that um, they wanted to share this with other students. They said, okay, we're really onto something here. So fast forward a few semesters and a few dozen projects later, they said, okay, we're about to graduate, but this is really something. This has created an impact. This has really changed some lives. So let's see um, what the future looks like for Greenlight. Um, we have this really incredible vision here. So that's when they did the Seed Spot Social Incubator, um, a business incubator, incubator for social uh, businesses with social impact. And they spent many long nights sleeping every night at the Seed Spot, uh, at the Seed Spot building, uh, kind of like we do during finals. And they did this intensive program, and then they came out of it saying, okay, we're going to create a 501c3 nonprofit. Fast forward 10 years later, we've now done, implemented 60 sustainability projects, trained over 350 students in sustainability project management, 
and um, worked with uh, 79 businesses. So, um, and really we just begun. And I'm really excited for each and every one of you to be a part of that journey. Um, so we've done these student-led sustainability projects for you know 10 years now, right? Um, that's our classic program. Um, but now uh, we've had 10 years of conversations with employers and students and small to medium businesses. And we've really kind of um, been able to understand the challenges that each of these groups face. So this is why we have expanded our program suite. So now we have the student-led projects and other programs to really meet the needs uh, of each of these communities. So first we have our green event services. So we had um, uh, people reach out to us and they said, hey, we have these huge event, we have landfill bins, can you help us out? So we said, okay, yeah, let's help them out. And now we've done six green event services. You'll actually hear from our green event services team tonight um, because they've helped us um, to really expand this program. So that's our first program besides the student-led projects. Next is our green light boot camps. So this is where we actually have a condensed version of our student-led projects. Um, where we work with study abroad students. We work with students from Japan, um, from Nanban University. We actually have another um, uh, a dozen students coming from uh, Japan, uh, from Nanban University this summer to work with us. And we've also worked with a couple dozen students from Saudi Arabia that were incredible to work with um, from Cal State University. Um, so next we uh, are piloting our dashboard. So this is something that we've been developing for about a year now, and we're really excited about this. And this is our platform that we've developed that will allow businesses to track their waste, water, social impact, and energy data. Not only that, but have the support and the resources to help them improve that data, be able to look at those metrics and say, okay, how can we get from point A to point B? So more information on that to come. Um, very, very excited about uh, that development. Um, last but not least is our recruiting service. So like I said, we are rounding out our program to really make sure that not only are we helping our students have that experience to add to their resumes and that training, those sustainability project management uh, skills, but then also we want to connect you to organizations that are hiring. We want to get you hired. So that's what happens at the end, or I would say the end of your college journey with Greenlight Solutions. So that's to say that just because you graduate, your journey as an alum with Greenlight uh, doesn't end there. So that is kind of where Greenlight's come from, where we're headed, and just really grateful for each and every one of you to really bring your unique strengths to the table um, to make the Greenlight mission what it is today. Um, you know, our mission is to educate and empower the next generation of sustainability leaders, and we can't do that without each and every one of you. So without further ado, let's get to these awesome projects because uh, these students killed it this semester. Thanks, guys. Now we'll bring to the stage the, <laughs> the Walton Services or Sustainability Services team. Okay, so this semester we uh, we partnered with um, again continuing the work of uh, um, Tyler Eglin with the uh, Walton School of Sustainability Solutions Services. Um, from the previous semester, we're working on, um, can you go to the next slide, producing five 20 kilogram spools of uh, filament and using those spools to produce um, a product that we can give back to the community. Thanks for giving us a quick introduction. Um, I guess we'll kind of introduce ourselves first. My name is Katie, and I'm a sophomore studying sustainability. I'm Noemi, I'm a junior studying sustainability. My name is Maddie. I'm a sophomore studying sustainability also. Oh, my name is Cameron Yeager. I'm a senior studying business for focusing on sustainability. My name is Ronaldo Moreno. I'm a graduate student focusing on environmental policy. All right. And so for our main project, we decided to work with the ProtoCycler, which is a 3D filament maker or extruder. Um, now, before we kind of dive into the project, has anyone worked with this kind of machine before? A show of hands. No one? Okay, well, hopefully we can give you guys some insight about what it is, what some of our challenges are, and why we're so passionate about this. Um, starting off with our project vision, which is that our project team would find the opportunity uh, to be able to recycle some plastics and really encourage uh, a plastic circular economy uh, to create connections within the community and be able to create products 
uh, products for uh, local community members. And so that was our main vision. And we really wanted to do this because we wanted to take some of that wasteful plastic that would either be diverted to landfills and cause ecological harm. Um, we want to try to use use that uh, kind of waste and turn it into something new, like a new product, or in this case, like new children's toys or educational material. And for um, our project, our main SDG goal that we talked about was number 12, which is responsible consumption and production. And the target that we most uh, kind of oriented ourselves with was target 12.5, which is by 2030, substantially reducing our waste generation uh, through prevention, recycling, and reduction. Um, and then using these targets, we wanted to, uh, they kind of motivated us to follow through with this project. And um, the main reason why we uh, wanted to use the protocycler as a way to recycle this filament is because of this SDG goal. And we really uh, valued the main, uh, we really valued the main mission of what this SDG goal represented. So that's kind of why we wanted to use the protocycler and be able to recycle this filament and try to create it into something new. And then our uh, key objectives for this project um, was first like making like some kind of handbook for the protocycler because it's really kind of like you have to know how to use it and there's a lot of specifics. So just like something for the next team uh, to really like be able to understand how to use it properly. And then we were also uh, have like an objective of making and like 3D printing designs made out of the recycled filament that we created, which is our third objective of creating um, five schools of recycled plastic, which we did not, we were not able to complete in this semester. So troubleshooting, we had quite a few issues on this project. Um, first um, issue was, um, First day in the office, the pro sector was jammed. So the way the pro sector works is you drop your shredded uh, shards of plastic into this little bin, and this auger rotates and feeds the plastic into the machine, and that was jammed. So we had many issues with that throughout kind of the entire semester. And after reading the user manual, we kind of discovered that it's not the machine can't handle kind of 100% recycled materials. I think it had to be at least like 50% like brand spanking new plastic, and then you can use a combination of like recycled materials. So that kind of defeated the purpose of our project since we wanted to, you know, use one hundred percent like recycled materials and turn that into filament. So that was one thing we were kind of struggling with. You said that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And then we had a non-functioning puller. So the way this machine works, we have this spooler where the plastic connects, and this rotates at a certain rate. And then inside here, you'll see right here. Yeah, this kind of squishy wheel which kind of spins at the same rate, so it kind of pulls the plastic evenly. And that puller wasn't working. And so when we were trying to extrude um, throughout the process, the spooler would be spinning. And then since that, you know, is gripping the plastic as well, but not moving, just kind of creating some friction, kind of ruining our kind of total extrusion process. That was another really big issue we had. Next was the grind time. So in the protocycler, um, you can drop, you know, very pieces of plastic that needs to be shredded in there. And unless you want like a four hour arm workout, it's it takes a long time and then I forgot to kind of explain you know it would take over three hours to create two tiny cars so we kind of and that's another reason that this prototype wasn't very optimal for what we were trying to accomplish and then software issues uh half of our laptops would not connect to the machine no matter how many times we downloaded undownloaded redownloaded um, the software and once we were able to do it um sending commands to this machine, you know, it's, it's kind of complicated. There's so many different variables you had to adjust and using using the software still like message A to B wasn't kind of getting through. So we kind of weren't, really weren't able to um, manipulate the different variables in the extrusion process as we wanted to. And 3D printer head jam. Outside the project, we had a, a 3D printer that we were testing out like um, possible things to print and uh, in this picture, you'll kind of see. So this is this is the head right here where I um, would be printing out of. And inside of here, there's kind of like huge buildup of plastic. We don't know how or why that happened, but we were, that was an issue where we we're able to kind of test out different products. We want to kind of see what we want to do with. Uh, despite all those issues we've had this semester, we were still able to create uh, or gather information for the next group and. Uh, add on to the handbook that last semester's team was able to begin and 
have really good notes on, but this way that the future teams have additional information to not start from ground zero, but to build off our experience from the semester. Additionally, we were able to print about 10 of each of these spirographs and octopus toys for the nonprofit Arizona is for Children that this nonprofit we're working for helps children throughout Arizona and they get about mm, about like 100 or so visitors to the center per week. So when communicating with this nonprofit, they wanted uh, interactive interactive products for these children and like also uh, educational items so they could um, do some learning. Uh, <laughs> some things we learned this semester with this team was that of different types of plastics that there are such as PLA and HDPE as well as their properties and uh, their melting points. Additionally, we also learned extrusion, extrusion theory and how difficult that could be with this 3D, 3D photo cycler, oh, sorry, this photo cycler and the 3D printer and all the different technicalities of the plastics. Yeah, we had to build patience with the technology as well as with each other. And finally, with this project, we learned a lot about communication communicating with each other, communicating with our project partner, Tyler, as well as Greenlight to get the full support and resources that we needed to continue on um, throughout the semester with despite all the te techni technical difficulties we were having. And then if you um, want to learn more about Walton Sustainability Solution Services and what they do, um, you can scan these QR codes and the top one will take you to their website. And then the bottom one is like contact information. If you guys have any project ideas or anything that you'd like to send to them, feel free. Um, they're very into any kind of circular economy projects and other um, big scale projects. And then if you want to connect with us on LinkedIn, uh, this is our name that we use. And yeah, thank you guys. All righty. Does anybody have any questions for them? You have one. Uh, and I'm sorry if you said this. Um, was there a type of plastic that you saw was the most recyclable? Uh, so the question was, is there a type of plastic that is the most recyclable? Uh, probably like PLA or HDP. They don't really... Um, lose much like structural integrity, how many, like, how many times you melt them down and like kind of redo them. So that's PLA and what? Uh, HCP is like high density quality. Thank you. Any other questions, Gemini, is there any in the chat? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Where are you guys getting your plastic from? We collect a ton of bottle caps. Greenlight collects them. Um, I know, Ashley knows that we have a ton of bottle caps and um, like, Bottle caps are just really easy because it's basically the plastic that we're able to melt um, because not all plastics can go through the machine, um, but bottle caps tend to be a PLA or an HPE, um, so we're able to use those. And um, that's what we shred in our own like the grinding process. And then we also get some from Tyler's lab um, where he like puts it through a like industrial grinder and it's nice and smooth. <laughs> Yes, Gemini. Um, what was your favorite part about? The question was, what was your favorite part? Um, <laughs> first. But yeah, my favorite part was um, like the stuff that we were able to extrude because I worked on this project last semester as well. So like seeing how far we have come it was like really impressive because last semester we weren't even able to like get any kind of consistency in our filament. Um, we forgot to bring the filament, but I wish we could show you what we were able to print um, was actually kind of impressive, like with what we were able to um, get, even though it wasn't like you couldn't use it, it was too inconsistent to use in a machine, but just what we were able to do was really impressive. So I like just being able to see that even though um, we weren't really able to like get any usable stuff. It's like a big step forward. I would say... Um... Like halfway through the semester, we went to um, Tyler's lab and he showed us around and like he showed us like how this applies like in, in a bigger scale and like different products that you can use from the plastic. So he would like, it wouldn't be necessarily the plastic you use from the bottle caps like PLA or HDPE, but he would use like um, stuff that people throw out for packaging. So like those big, large containers that they use for pallets, he would uh, like put in like a, like his like custom built um, cycler and he would get the plastic melted down and he'd make like like solid planks that you can use to like 
pretty much like plastic lumber to like produce things and he like make um like long boards that were actually pretty like sturdy when compared to like a, a wood board where you the emissions and like all the energy that goes into getting that wood would probably be about the same as producing the plastic if not less than the wood one of my favorite things about this semester was uh, working with my fellow peers <laughs> i love connecting with them and um able to see what we were like to problem solve and how we were able to create this atmosphere of even though our progress could seem as slow and uh, dis disappointing or discouraging but we were still able to connect with one, each other, with one another and learn from each other and just have a good time overall so. I'm going to second that and say I really liked working um, in a group I think that challenge like tackling a challenging problem like this and being able to like unjam the photocycler and just going through those small accomplishments. Um, it really creates like a nice team building environment. And um, it was just really nice to have a group that we can all kind of suffer together, but also uh, <laughs> be proud of our accomplishments, which is really cool. Um, my favorite part about this project, probably learning about extrusion theory and kind of just messing around with trying to, trying to get the extrusion process you know, as smooth as possible. You know. Sitting there on the computer is like messing with all the different variables. It was quite tedious, but make that's like that little product uh, progress I made. I wanted to kind of just almost be good enough and for just a little bit of time. It was like it was really fun. Thank you. All the sustainability services. Um, so next up, you got the green event services. All right. Thank you everyone so much for, for being here. Um, so this project cycle, we work with Green Event Services, um, and now we can go ahead and introduce ourselves. I'm Kiara. I'm a sophomore here at ASU studying environmental design, and this is my second semester of Green Light Solutions. I'm Jenna. I'm on Zoom today. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you, Jenna. Okay, cool. Um, I'm a freshman at Northern Arizona University studying sustainability, and this is my first semester with Green Light Solutions. Uh, so my name is Bryce Campbell. I'm a senior here at ASU studying business with a minor in sustainability. Um, this is my second semester here at Greenlight. All right, so kind of like I said, so Green Event Services was our project partner. Um, so Green Event Services is basically the event and waste management arm of Greenlight Solutions. Um, so as a whole, we do waste services. So um, like identifying waste management partners, uh, coordinating dumpsters and composting services, for instance, we also do volunteer coordination. So we recruit all of the volunteers that help us at these events. Uh, we train them beforehand so that on the day of the event, they show up prepared, they know what to do. Also materials, so coordinating all the bins. We have waste bins, recycling, land, um, compost bins. Uh, and then we also bring our own signage as well at these events. And finally, PR branding. So that's, uh, we always measure the weight of recyclables collected or compost generated. And then we can use that information to generate um, a, a waste diversion rate, which our partner events can then use to uh, boost their own brand to demonstrate their sustainability. Um, so Gemini Boudry here in the back, she's the program coordinator here at Greenlight. She was our main point of contact for Green Event Services. The last thing I'll say is this little QR code, um, if you want to scan it, it'll take you to the Green Event Services website. Oh, sorry. Um, and so you can just learn more about Green Event Services through that. So the purpose of the project, um, Green Event Services aimed to expand its reach to achieve high waste diversion at more events. So probably the biggest challenge was outreach to event partners. Uh, going into this project cycle, we were partnered with the Mesa Marathon um, and the Tour de Fat, but we really want to expand that reach, partner with more events, just uh, provide our services at a greater scale. Also volunteer based. So um, historically, the volunteers have been from you know Greenlight itself. It's been you guys, but we also want to recruit from other areas at ASU, as well as from other institutions, um, and also just a greater, you know, Phoenix area. Uh, and then finally, awareness education. So there's a lot of attendees at these events who, you know, don't really know what they can compost, what they can recycle. So uh, we take pride in, in doing bin guarding. So really just standing there by the bins and really making sure people know exactly what can go in each bin. Okay, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about our project vision and our mission. 
So our vision for this project was basically to find events in the Phoenix area and also all around Arizona um, and help them reduce the burden that they're having on their landfills and also the surrounding environment um, by helping them with like waste diversion. So our mission was to promote awareness to these event organizers and also the attendees of these events um, through guiding local communities to prioritize recycling and waste reduction just to have these events with the most like minimal impact on the surrounding environment. Um, so our objectives and key performance indicators for this project. So our first objective was just to find these events. So we were aiming to create a list of events in Phoenix and also all around Arizona. So to do so, we sent out 15 emails per week. Um, and the goal is to receive responses from 10 contacts um, and then as well as schedule for events for 2023. Our second objective was to successfully execute one of these events. Um, and achieve a 40% waste diversion rate at that event. And then our last objective was just to build a volunteer base that's available year round. So these are just registered volunteers with Greenlight Solutions that are available to help us out at these events um, in order to achieve this waste diversion rate. Um, so we also sent out 15 emails per week for that. And we were aiming to receive responses from five contacts for that. So moving on to our solutions. So in order to partner with more events and get people involved in our organization, we created an email template that we sent out to those contacts that I was mentioning in the previous slide. Um, and we were able to organize from this from sending out this template, we organized 11 different partner meetings um, with the events that you can see the logos for around the screen there. So some of those were like the Sedona Yoga Festival, Country Camp Festival, Celebrate Mesa, et cetera. Um, and then, we were able to actually execute two of those events. So Celebrate Mesa and Core Energy. Um, and then additionally, we also created an infographic to be sent out to our volunteer organizations. Um, so uh, we will talk more about that in the next slide. And so like uh, Jenna just mentioned, we did Celebrate Mesa, um, which was pretty much a local family fun style festival in Mesa on April 15th. Um, there was, you know, music playing, there were a bunch of vendors set up, Greenlight had its own booth there, um, and there were a lot of food trucks, and so our job was to provide composting services for this event, um, so we had two waste stations, one on each side of the food trucks, where we had uh, waste recycling and compost bins, and we were bin guarding, so we were making sure people knew, you know, what they could compost, what they could recycle, we did waste sorting as needed to uh, reduce contamination, and it was really successful, so we were able to generate 120 pounds of compost, which is in terms of the emissions, it's equivalent to about 93 miles driven for your average, you know, four door passenger vehicle, kind of like a Ford Focus. So not, you know, a ton of mileage, but still, you know, collecting just a little bit of food here and there, it definitely adds up and we can still make that impact. We also did an Earth Day celebration for the company Core Energy. Um, so this was a smaller event uh, at Maya's farm in Phoenix. And so we did everything for them. We did waste recycling, compost, um, and we were able to generate a 68% waste diversion rate. So we generated more recyclables and compost than we did waste. To ensure that these events ran smoothly, we thought that we needed to create a volunteer team that could help us with bin guarding, bin transporting, waste sorting, and more. So we created this flyer and we sent it out to different organizations, ASU clubs, um, and so on, and successfully recruited five individuals that will be helping us with events in the future. Our sustainability goal for this project was 12 responsible consumption and production, and that is a call for a comprehensive set of actions from businesses, policymakers, research and researchers, and consumers to adapt to sustainable practices. And during our project, we provided a sustainability service with a system that diverted waste. And not only did we mitigate the trash going into landfills, we also educated the community um, with our bins and our process. If you'd like to learn more about us, or if you'd like to volunteer with us, or set up a time if you're hosting an event and you'd like our services, you can follow this QR code um, and learn all about it. And these are our LinkedIn's. If you'd like to scan these QR codes or look up our names, you can find us. I 
right, anybody got questions for them? No questions on their day. Yeah. yeah, what was the, uh, uh, what was your favorite event for? All right, so for those on Zoom, the question was, what was their favorite event to work? I'd say, I'd say it was uh, the Four Energy Earth Day celebration, um, just because it was a little, you know, smaller event. So you actually got to interact more with the participants and the other vendors there. Um, so it was more, you know, that that family feel. Um, and, you know, it was definitely smaller, so we didn't collect as much compost, but we still felt like we're making a pretty big difference. Absolutely. What was your question? Yeah. What was your biggest challenge at the events when trying to collect compost? All right, so what was the biggest challenge at the events when trying to collect the compost? Yeah, I'd, I'd say, um, you know, there's sometimes there's not always going to be volunteers by the bin, right? And even if we have signage on the bin, some people might not know what they can compost. Um, some people might not care. Um, and so it's it's doing the waste sorting at the end of the event sometimes because, you know, there is occasionally contamination in the bins. Um, and so we always, you know, go through after and just make sure, you know, all the compost is compost. Sometimes if there's a lot of things in the trash or recycling bins that can be composted, you know, we actually transfer those to the compost bin. Um, but it's kind of just having that contamination every once in a while. You have to limit yourself in terms of the size of the event based on the number of volunteers you have or capacity. So the question was, do they have to limit themselves uh, for the size of the event based on the number of volunteers and their capacity for it? I'd say no, because we have all the supplies, we have signs, we have bins. So if we are at a larger event and don't have enough volunteers to actually guard the bins and make sure that the correct waste is going in, then we do still have them there to get it sorted. And at the end, even if it'll take a little bit longer, we still get everything done. So we did the Mesa Marathon earlier, although we didn't really talk about it. Um, that was in February where we were at. So that's about like 6,000, 7,000 people. Um, and we were able to have like 15 volunteers there. So there's not, you know, too, too many events larger than that, um, at least close by. So in terms of, you know, to scale, we haven't really... Uh, had too much of an issue with that. We take on something like the World Control Marathon. He said, "So we we did reach out. We were in contact with them. We did, were not able to to get a meeting with them. Um, so you know, I I think it's definitely possible. We definitely have the capacity for that, um, especially with our recruiting for volunteers. You know, and that's going to continue into the future with you know the next project cycles and so on. So." Um, I don't think there's any event too big for, for green event services. Yes. Do you work with clients prior to the event to let them know methods or uh, practices that they could implement to you know, reduce their waste and save energy before we go get to the day of? Absolutely. So we always have an intro call first off just to learn more about both sides, you know, so we can learn more about their event and what they've done in the past. They can learn about our services. But we always stay in contact. You know, it's those it's those emails every single day, like up until for the whole week, up until the actual event. Um, you know, communication is key. Just being on the same page, and um, if you do that, the event will go well. So, thank you, Green Event Services. I was a part of the Mesa Marathon, and that was like a very rewarding experience. So, anybody out there. Definitely get them on LinkedIn and uh, see how you can help and be a part of it. Um, next up, we're going to invite the green education team up. Okay, so um, thank you all for being here tonight. We're very happy that, that you came out and shared some of your time with us. So we're going to be presenting our spring 2020 green, green light solutions event. I mean, sorry, project that was in collaboration with Green Education US. And before we do any of that, I kind of just want to give a really quick shout out to our project mentor, Michael, who has been like a really great help and has always been there for support and anything that we needed. So we just want to say thank you. I don't believe he's in the room with us, but we do appreciate him. Um, and for a little bit of introduction, my name is Yasmin Calderon Feliciano, and I am one of the leads for this project. Um, I'm studying sustainability and environmental science, sorry, environmental studies in basically community college, graduating in May, so in a couple of weeks. 
Um, and yeah, that's it. I've been working with Green Light Solutions for three semesters now, and I'd like to, you know, encourage the team to do, introduce themselves as well. Hi, my name is Jane Hill. I am also a co-lead for this project. I'm a junior at Arizona State University studying conservation biology and ecology, and it is my first semester here at Green Light. Um, I'm Ocean Angel, I'm a solution leader. I am a sophomore studying electrical engineering with a minor in sustainability. This is my second semester. Hi, I'm online. Uh, my name is Josh Jeffers. I'm a solution leader uh, as well. Um, I just want to give a small introduction to our project in a way that involves the audience. So we created two different surveys. And since we know that there are both sustainability professionals and students in the crowd with us today, we would greatly appreciate if you could pull out your phones, scan these QR codes, and take our surveys. It will only take a couple of minutes. And if you are a sustainability student looking to be more fit for your future sustainability job, please take the student survey. And if you are an employer looking to have more future employees that have the sustainability skills that you're looking for, please take the employer survey. And we will also have these QR codes listed throughout the presentation. And we'll touch more on this aspect of the project later as well. So now I'm going to send it off to Ocean, who will tell you a bit about our project partners. So actually, before we get into that, we're going to talk a little bit about the waste problem that we have, right? So did you know that in the United States, um, we generate about 268 million tons of waste per year, with 140 million tons going directly to landfills, and the average American generates about four and a half pounds of waste every single day. And so obviously, there's a problem, right? And there are, of course, things that we can do to reduce our intake and to reduce, you know, what ends up in the landfills. But there really is so much that we can do on a personal level, right? So what we need in this world and in this country, most of all, are sustainability experts that know how to correctly assess the waste issue and how to, you know, move forth with managing these resources sustainably in the in the first place. And I really solutions solutions we support the workforce of sustainable resource management and because of that we can recognize that green education us is at the very forefront of that so with that being said now ocean can go ahead and give you a little bit more information on our project partner and thank you yes and for those who are not familiar with that green education us is an organization that offers diverse programs um, within sustainability taught by industry expert instructors these um, opportunities include virtual mentoring, sustainable resource management, and online courses that are in a vast array of different sustainability fields. Um, Green, uh, Green Education US is the perfect solution for both those who are new to the field as well as seasoned professionals who are seeking extra training. And then um, here is our project partner who we had the wonderful chance to work with this semester. Her name is Jill Dinello. She has over 20 years of experience with working with high performing teams with creating content live and she's the current manager of educational programs at Green Education US. She oversees the sustainable resource management program, which is currently the only nationally recognized um, program within sustainable resource management. We are having our other um, solution here, Josh, doing this part so. Hopefully you guys can hear him off the computer. Go ahead, Josh. Hi, can everyone hear me? Um, okay, so for this project, our challenge was to market Green Education US in order to reach broader audiences to have them learn about the programs offered by our project partner. Additionally, we wanted this organization, we want to provide this organization, sorry, with data and feedback through survey creation and analysis that delved into the current state of the sustainability industry as we surveyed employers and college students for their unique perspective. Um, Did you guys want to re-say that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, so I know you guys can't hear, he's on, on the computer, but um, so our semester plan, again, is um, was to create two surveys, each with a distinct um, purpose. We'll touch more on this later. Um, and then the outreach, so there were two parts to this. The outreach was marketing the Green Education US programs to students. We kind of wanted to gather more of a student population that was taking you know, part in the Green Education programs because that's just something that our project partner was looking for. So that was the semester plan. So uh, for our product vision and mission, our vision for this project was to increase the overall awareness of green education services to a broader network of current and aspiring sustainability professionals. And our mission as the Green Education US project team 
was to create two surveys to collect sustainability oriented data from employers and students respectively and also to collaborate with other organizations to directly promote green education in us as education opportunities so for those in the room with us um so just to reiterate what josh is saying online um our vision was to expand network right so again as i mentioned we're trying to gather more more students um, mainly but also just in general more people who know about green education maybe businesses who want to take that in and offer these trainings to their employees and so our mission therefore was to create two surveys to kind of um, market as well as the general green education um, information and then that feedback that we collected is going to go directly to Jill Bonello from our you know, green education U.S. project partner. Um, and as far as the survey creation we can go a little bit more in depth on that now so we did make two right so the student survey and the employer survey as you've seen the student survey was created in order to reach uh, sustainability students or you know somewhere in that field that could include environmental science urban planning agriculture that sort of stuff right um, and what we wanted to know was what they thought about green education programs. So did they think that it was um, kind of fitting to them and where they thought they were going career wise, maybe they should, you know, um, invest in more programs. And so here are a few things we found for that one was that out of all the students that we interviewed coming from ASU, MCC and NYU, 100% of those students were in completely different um, career paths, actually. So that included like academia and education government and policy, um, environmental protection, conservation, these are all listed right here. Um, we found that 100% of them found an in, in interest in certificate in sorry, sorry, <laughs> sustainable resource management, and 100% of them um, named money constraints as their main obstacle for um, the reason that they were not approaching green education. Um, our employer survey, on the other hand, was created to interview employers on what it is that they were actually looking for um, in college graduates fresh out of you know um, college that were majoring in sustainability or something um, of that sort and we found that 66.7 percent of those employers that we interviewed preferred for a student to have a sustainability degree while the rest of them kind of didn't really have a preference we also found that 33 percent of the employers surveyed um, rated the knowledge on sustainable resource management as very important so something that i should mention is that these results are not final as you know we've offered the surveys up for all of you to take um, we hope that as we gain more um, data we'll be able to uh, take that in and analyze it as as we have here Josh is going to go ahead and come online as well uh, now we can take a look at what really made our process and overall project successful we established the first objective of creating a pool of data offering relevant information from sustainability employers to students. We knew we would have reached this goal after creating two surveys, each with a different scope. Our second objective was to promote green education's courses and programs to organizations whose beliefs aligned with ours in seeing the importance of creating the next generation of sustainability professionals. Our green, our, our key performance indicator for this objective was four features. In other words, we wanted to have our information posted on four different accounts and preferably through different platforms. So once again, going over that, um, we did have our two objectives. Objective one was to create a pool of data that we were pulling out from these surveys. Um, and that was going to be going to distinct groups, right? So the employer survey, the results from that are going to ideally be going to college students so that they know and can be more, infor more informed on what it is that employers are looking for. While the student survey, those results are gonna go directly to Jill Donello so that she knows um, how to manage maybe their their website better and programs and then objective two was the collaboration with organizations to promote green education as we mentioned um, and our kpi was four features which essentially meant that we wanted to be featured um, maybe via linkedin post or facebook post and instagram story so just four of those so those were our key performance indicators for that objective so our second objective was completed by collaborating with different organizations and ideally, we wanted to have four instances in which external organizations promoted Green Education US's programs, courses, and opportunities, as well as the two surveys we created. So as you can see up here, these are our four instances. So USGBC Mountain Region posted about us on their LinkedIn. UNA ASU reposted Greenlight Solutions Instagram posts. And then the gentleman of quality at NYU reposted this on their Slack account. So the main social media sources we 
um, how to social media outreach through was LinkedIn, Instagram, and Slack. And we are currently still in the process of collecting data, so our results aren't finalized yet. However, we're ex still excited to show that we have six student survey responses and then six employee survey responses. And with collective effort for collaboration, we were able to reach out to 28 companies. And out of those 28 companies, we were able to secure five successful collaborations. And those collaborations are with these companies on this right side of the slide, one of them being our own personal network at Greenlight Solutions. And so as far as sustainable development goals, we found that the one that most aligned with our project was the SDG 17, which is partnership for the goals. And this, um, we kind of want to really focus on the target 17.16, which defines itself as uh, multi-stakeholder partnerships that mobilize and share knowledge technology, expertise, and financial resources in order to advance the achievement of the sustainable development goals created by the United Nations in 2015. So we learned a lot and we explored different areas within this project. First and foremost, we learned how to create and distribute surveys um, in order to collect customer data. In addition, we um, learned how to um, reach out to multiple stakeholders and we also learned how to make intriguing infographics and captions in order to reach out to these stakeholders. Um, as a result of this project, we have gained some valuable feedback that will help further promote green education's learning platform. Uh, thank you for listening to this presentation. And then we have our LinkedIn profiles for you if you'd like to connect with us. And with that being said, um, we can open for questions now. Yes, go ahead. What do you think was the hardest part um, overall in your project for connecting with like the organization and like the relationship with the team? So for those on Zoom, the question was, uh, what do you feel was the hardest part of connecting with the organizations? So definitely it was just the fact that obviously not everyone has time to respond to, you know, emails. And then, I mean, we're kind of just like some random group reaching out and saying, hey, we have this thing. We really want you to, you know, support us and maybe we can form a collaboration. Um, sometimes that just doesn't fall within, you know, the vision that they want for themselves. And that's okay. And it's completely understandable. But of course, that just makes it harder on our end to, you know, secure those collaborations and really make this project happen. All right. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you, Green Education US. Um, next, we're going to bring up the Dynamic RE team. Well, hello, we're the Dynamic RE Project team. Thank you all for coming here and taking time out of your day to come witness our presentation. Um, everyone's worked tirelessly on creating a database that we feel will really benefit society if utilized properly. So I'll hand it over to Ryan to begin our uh, presentation, but prior to that, <laughs> prior to that, I just want to introduce our lovely team. So I'm Monisa, this is Natalie, that's Ryan, and we have Maniza. We have two other members, Barira and Harshit. They were unable to make it here today, but they were also, they're here in spirit. Um, so we'll start off with that. All right. Uh, thank you, Manasa. Yeah, my name is Ryan. I am an ASU online student in the Master of Sustainability Leadership Program. So I flew out here from SoCal to be here for y'all. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, we'll get into the deliverables for our project. So um, the Dynamic RE project is with um, Dynamic RE, which is a startup real estate company focused on the intersection of sustainability and real estate. And um, our project is building upon an existing database that the previous group of solutioneers from last semester began. Um, so yeah, like I said, we're expanding this database. It spans from San Diego, California, all the way to New Haven, Connecticut. Um, so with this project, we're compiling different rebates and incentives that homeowners or developers can take advantage of um, in transitioning their homes to be a little bit more sustainable. So some of the different areas are with waste management. So um, we found a lot of resources with um, like free mulch that municipalities were offering to residents um, and then energy efficiency. So a lot of these would have to do with lighting or solar to you know, cut down on um, energy and reduce those carbon emissions in homes. And then with housing and appliances, this related to things like um, water heaters or using electric stoves instead of gas stoves, all of which would cut down on uh, CO2 emissions. 
And then um, we had a lot for water consumption. So this had a lot to do with like turf replacement or, um, you know, getting um, like a water tank, water collection tank in your backyard. I saw some municipalities offering that for free for certain residents. So that's really awesome in uh, drought scarce uh, areas. And then community engagement was one of the largest parts of our project because we are doing this so homeowners or developers, like I said, can take advantage of these rebates um, and make sustainability a little bit more affordable to them. Um, next slide. All right, so to find these different rebates and incentives, we had uh, two different ways of researching. So our primary method of research was to reach out to different um, municipalities, governments, and utility companies who were offering these different rebates to get a little bit uh, more of an understanding of what the rebate is and how the homeowners or developers um, could take advantage of these rebates. Um, and our secondary means of research was through broad online searches. So going to these utility companies or government's websites and just seeing um, you know, what the different um, rebates that they have are. All right, next slide. And so our vision for this project um, is to bridge the gap between sustainability and real estate. So real estate accounts for more than 30% of global emissions, and it's valued at over trillions of dollars globally. So real estate is huge. And um, if we can make it a little bit more sustainable, that is so important. And uh, with Dynamic RE and this uh, database, it makes it more individual. We all have to take actions to lower our carbon footprint. And um, with the database, homeowners can see, hey, uh, I live in you know, San Diego and there's this rebate for LED lights. And then they're cutting back on their energy a little bit. So uh, next slide. And our mission. So how did we uh, work to solve our deliverables and reach our vision for this project? So um, like I said, we have this database that we're trying to, you know, uh, put together. So each of us were assigned three to four cities uh, throughout the United States, and we aim to find at least 10 resources uh, per city that we were uh, assigned to. And so we wanted to find uh, these rebates from, you know, two different sources, uh, not all of them from one utility company or one government. So um, yeah, and then we, with our primary research of reaching out to the different utility companies or different governments, we wanted to get, you know, around five interviews uh, for each of them. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I want to outline some key definitions here. I already alluded to most of them, but our users, so who can actually utilize the information that we're providing? This genuinely, hopefully this showcases that gen genuinely anyone could into these resources, right? If you own a home, if you're renting a home, if you live within a home, if you're trying to invest in uh, real estate, if you fall into any of these categories, you're going to be able to utilize the database that we've created. And I think this really helps to notice that, you know, sustainability initiatives can start with you. You don't need to defer responsibility to these large institutions that are making really poor decisions ecologically because we have the capability to still make pretty motive, like impactful changes at an individual level. Thank you for the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so resources. So the predominant resource that we relied upon were rebates. So those are a type of monetary incentive. So if you rely upon a sustainable initiative, um, whether it be a program, a tool, a company, or an uh, incentive, you can benefit from that monetarily. So you can get a certain sum if you switch to solar, things like that. So if you give it the next one, thank you. So an infographic. So we created an infographic, but I just uh, took a few slides that we thought would best show the monetary threshold. So here we can see the key um, headings that we talked about just now. So users and resources and initiatives that we targeted. So these are a few cities that we focused on unveiling data from. So you can see you can save anywhere from four hundred to ten thousand dollars in savings. So that's a big monetary leap. And I think this is important to note because when you're trying to buy a house or you're in the market in real estate, it's a very expensive endeavor, right? It's not something that everyone can afford. So just knowing that you can make a change environmentally by and benefit monetarily is like a big thing. I feel like that's going to be beneficial to anyone who's in the market for housing right now. So if we go to the next slide. So this is once again, just showing some of the steps and showing the next set of municipalities that we targeted. Um, 
<laughs> Thank you. So our key, our, our key performance indicators, um, we also outlined these briefly before, but our goal was to conduct both primary and secondary research. So we reached out via interviews to utility companies. We also did like a broad internet search to find out any sustainable resources and rebates that they were providing. And so we had our initial goal as, conduct, as compiling at least five resources from each of these sectors. But we ended up actually meeting our overestimate for secondary research, which was a big success. So we got to at least 10 resources per um, city, which was um, very nice. Um, as for the interview responses, sadly, we were unable to reach that overestimate, but we still reached the uh, minimal line. So I think that's a big success as well. Um, so, yeah, so I'll hand it over to Natalie for sustainable. So our project aimed to work towards some of the sustainable development goals that were set in place by the United Nations. And these goals include goal number six, clean water and sanitation. Goal number seven, affordable and clean energy. Goal number 11, sustainable cities and communities. Goal number 12, responsible consumption and production. And goal 13, climate action. And um, all of these goals work towards um, conservation and efficiency overall. All right, our group learned a lot of lessons along the way. So currently there are many sustainable opportunities for homeowners to take advantage of, but there's currently not enough knowledge or awareness around these rebates. Um, and then our team faced some setbacks in collaboration. There was poor responsivity to communication efforts at some points and a lack of familiarity with the program since many of us are new. And we were easily able to overcome these obstacles by you know, reaching out to our green light mentors and getting that feedback. And this was a good lesson in group efforts for sure. We also faced some setbacks while researching. So there was a limited amount of sustainable real estate resources and rebates in each city. Um, when we hit a wall in our research for each city, we would look to state rebates for homeowners in that city, and we could still take advantage of those as well. Also, some cities offered certain things like rebates for low income families, um, while others did not at all. And we thought that it was important to take notice of this while compiling information for the dynamic RE website. It is vital that we recognize equity and justice issues when thinking about sustainability. All right. And then when asked, what is inspiring about our project it is inspiring that we are helping sustainable initiatives tackle large world issues by creating change at a local level so every little step of the way towards creating a sustainable future counts and this usually starts at a local level this project is helping provide more information to homeowners and creating a sense of community and neighborhoods around the nation and next i'm going to hand it over to Manisa. thanks Natalie. so why this project matters um, homeowners have a really big part to play when it comes to climate uh, change, and they don't realize that. And with this database, we hope to change it since we will be connecting them with utility companies and non-government organizations that help them reduce their carbon footprint and also adopt more sustainable practices. So the why purpose um, the United States has pledged to uh, achieve net zero emissions by the year 2050, but that is only possible if everyone plays their role. And homeowners can also contribute when uh, they are, uh, the locals are the ones who suffer the most when it comes to climate change and uh, in terms of water scarcity and high utility bills. So they can uh, make use of our database and they can um, find support from federal and uh, state organizations. Why the audience should care? So um, with our database, um, we, we have established that even though buying a new home, it can be very expensive, but people can be sustainable and save money at the same time. Also, when they are supporting these causes, the people in power will take notice and they'll be inclined to introduce more sustainable policies, sustainable policies. And going forward, this will help uh, preserve our earth and make the planet a better place to live. So what next steps should we undertake? So we've actually been currently working with Samaj data in order to make our database more accessible. So this is more so um, a next step that's a bit far off in the future. It might take a few years to fully implement because there are some gaps in our data. 
But essentially, as you can see here, this is a prototype of what they're working on. And they have a map that's interactive. Individuals can search up areas that they want to travel to or they're interested in buying houses in. And it'll tell you um, environmental issues that are present there, any um, rebates or um, resources that are present there if they want to actually settle down and all these like key information points. So we feel like our data set would like fit perfectly into this uh, framework. So that's why we've communicated with them and we've established relations. We still have um, a lot of like minutiae to work out, but we're definitely going to take that as our big next step. So we encourage anyone who's interested in this project to partake with us. And thank you. So we especially want to like offer thanks to everyone being present here, but uh, particularly Gemini and Ashley and our project partners, our mentor Rizwan, uh, Mosfor, every single one of you guys have been in on this journey. A lot of us are new to green light solutions, so we were all a bit concerned going into this project, um, but you guys offered like countless amounts of guidance and advice, and that really helped us. So we couldn't have made it this far without you guys, and we just wanted to voice our thanks. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to open it up for questions. Anybody have any? Yes. So if you could like think back to that database you created, I kind of just want to ask what city stood out to you, whether that was in a positive way or a negative way, maybe like one of them had really impressive rebates or you know anything like that. What stood out to you? You know, as you guys are more inside with that. I can share. Um, I was surprised by how many rebates there were in Austin. Um I don't really think of Texas as the sustainability central, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of them in Austin. So Austin that was definitely yeah. Texas. Yeah, it was it was great. So that that's what surprised me. Thank you. And then on the opposite side of that, I researched one of my cities was Phoenix, and I found that cities around like Mesa, Chandler offered a lot of rebates, but specifically. The City of Phoenix did not, which is a big surprise to me, especially living here my entire life and you know going to ASU in the School of Sustainability. So um, that's definitely somewhere we can develop more for sure. <laughs> okay. uh, where can we find these resources that you guys did? So right now it's going to be published on the Dynamic RE website. So they have a website that's shared with Greenlight, and I believe it's just like Dynamic RE and Greenlight Partnership website. I think that's the title. Um, I'm sure you can broad search that and get to the website. Um, but that's where our data will be accessible, and soon it'll be on some launch data. But that's going to be a more, bit more in the future. Um, one more. Did yes. you guys happen to learn anything about how some of these uh, cities are implementing the law that was passed last year? And how those might affect some of the rebates or anything like that? I didn't look into legislation, so I'm not sure if anyone conducted personal research on that because I, I don't believe so. I'm sorry to help you. Yeah. But we'll definitely look into that going forward. They just have a whole bunch of like housing rebates that are yeah. supposed to be taking effect in the next year or so. And so I'm just curious if you have anything. Okay. Sounds good. We'll definitely look into that. Yes. Um, how receptive were like the utility companies to like your guys' abilities and transparent? All right, so this question is about how receptive and transparent the utility companies were for the interviews. So the approach that I used when reaching out to utility companies was to apply like um, a user who was looking for their service. So in that regard, they were actually quite receptive um, because they provided their information on potential rebates and they're like, reach out if you're interested. So I just like reached out in that regard and they so naturally kind of had to respond to my inquiries. I did state that I was an undergraduate researcher for Greenlight Solutions, which was like an organization affiliated with ASU, and I explained that, and I think that just made them more compelled to share, but the, at times I did feel like individuals were a bit more hesitant at that point too, because their information was being publicized in some sort of way, um, but I think it just helped to kind of like, to, it sounds wrong to say deceptive, um, but use them kind of like approaches where you blend it in with the community they were trying to appeal to. Any more questions? Yes, got one from Mature. Uh, what do you think Dynamic can do moving forward? So I think the next steps is perfect for that. I know that Dynamic was actually assumed recently by a larger company. So I'm not sure exactly like what regulations are going to be imposed upon them right now, but if they can form partnerships with smart data, that would be beautiful. And I know that Bas and I have both been working with uh, members of that team to get that 
jump started. So that's the immediate next step. Um, beyond that, I think that's left to exploration. <laughs> And follow-up question, what should we do to move the sustainability conversation? Like we said in our presentation, just more knowledge and awareness. I mean, most people, when I say my major is sustainability, they go, what is that? So you even have to explain what that word means, you know, making something last, whether that be in the economy, um, in social life, the environment, literally just about anything. So honestly, just spreading the word more, and um, the more people hear it and see it, the more inclined they will be to get involved, hopefully, and create a sustainable future. Um, I kind of want to add something, too. I feel like we need to, you know, focus more, a little bit more on individual responsibility, right? I feel like a lot of the times the conversation is about how corporations or governments can do more to be more sustainable, but really, one person can make such a huge difference. Um, if we all do just a little bit to cut back, that will have huge impacts. And you could kind of see that with the dynamic RE project. Um, it's not to say that, you know, everybody has the resources to be able to do so, but uh, that's what I appreciate about this is it makes it more accessible for those wanting to be sustainable and they can save money to do it, so. All right, my friends, wonderful presentation. And I know that, you know, through the challenges and the new learnings, you know, the, it's all about the learning process. So again, really proud of you guys. And I hope that you really take some time to reflect on the challenges and the things that you learned and how you can stay connected with everyone on your project team and your project partner and the other um, people that you networked with through, the, through your green light journey. Because think about it, even five, 10 years down the line, even longer down the line, hey, you can still re reach out to your green light family and say, hey, I know you're working in energy right now. I'm, I'm doing a project, let's collaborate, right? We can all be a movement moving forward together, um, helping each other to create that future that we wanna see, right? Um, and I know that each and every one of you are going to be those change makers doing that. So now talking about uh, uh, how you can stay involved with Greenlight Solutions. Of course, you can continue on a, a student-led sustainability project. We have internships, um, uh, project partners, uh, businesses, and solution year mentors. Uh, our application deadline is June 23rd. Uh, solution years, our application deadline is August 25th. Um, I'm sorry, the hub is 28th, and you do not need to apply again if you're already a solutioneer. You would just need to pick your next project um, and contribute to grow green light. So, of course, as a nonprofit, um, you know contributions from the uh, from the community are what um, allows us to move forward. So, um, green light low is our monthly donor program. Um, even five dollars a month um, is super helpful. Um, and then last but not least is our fund committee. So fund, uh, as mentioned earlier, it stands for um, fundraising, uplifting, and networking. Just five hours per month just to uh, bring what you want um, to the table. Uh, we have a graphic designer on the fund committee, and she helps us with our brand book. Um, we have uh, our engagement lead, Alan, loves to table and like talk to people. And so he does a lot of uh, this for us at, at these different events. So really, it's just a way to kind of continue with the with the community and uh, help us move forward and expand. Um, another thing that I want to mention is we have used our green light guidelines training. Um, it's been around for years now, right? But now um, we brought it online, which we're really excited about. We have those video tutorials for you guys, really just giving you those pro tips through every step of that green light process. Uh, which are really those best practices for sustainability project management. So we're really excited about that. But with every new evolution comes new challenges, right? So we're going to have a round of feedback sessions, um, solution years, project partners, mentors, just so we can continue to grow and um, find those gaps and um, really just make sure that everyone's having the best experience possible. We're going to actually have a lot of changes to the student program starting next semester. And I want everyone to be part of that conversation um, to make sure that we're making the best program possible. Of course, with um, having our virtual projects now, we used to just be at ASU, right? So now with having the virtual projects, you have the awesome uh, opportunity of, hey, you can work with students from all these different universities uh, across the world. Super awesome. But then there comes new challenges. So let's have that discussion um, and just find the best way forward. And really excited to just continue that conversation with everyone. Um, really proud of you guys, incredible projects. 
And now I am going to hand it off to Matt to finish up. Well, I guess this uh, kind of comes to the conclusion of another Greenlight Solutions um, term. And it's just like really cool to see where everybody started and then see the projects at the end, like really come out. And I think that uh, the uh, Walton group, like you guys are like a direct re representation of like what sustainability is all about. It's like battling that adversity, like every step of the way. And then still seeing that growth at the end of it. So super cool. Um, good to see it all come. Thank you guys so much for all your hard work. Uh, and then shout out to the board of directors and um, Ashley as well, and Gemini too. You guys uh, really make the wheels go round and solutioneers, you guys are the nuts and bolts. And I hope that me and the rest of the LT team uh, really felt supportive throughout the whole process too, like easily to reach out. So thanks again, guys. And this already has me looking forward to December showcase next year showcased in the fall so uh thanks so much y'all